I, I think this is a really an exciting occasion to have all of, all of you wonderful readers celebrating Vincent. We're going to begin tonight with Tom Ellis. Tom is the captain of the schooner, the Thomas E. Lannan. He will be reading the poem titled The First Encounter, which Vincent wrote after he sailed on the Lannan. So, Tom. I read this poem frequently. Um, I've probably read it at least a hundred times to people. And uh, people really relate to the feeling that Vincent got and uh, then they start going off on, on what it's meant for them to be on. So it's, uh, it's something that really opens people's um, thoughts and emotions and they verbalize it because of this poem. The First Encounter for Kay and Tom. It was a virgin voyage for me and I said things that were intimate and deep-rooted as I hung on a rope from the masthead on a storming slant and turning equal to the freedom waters on a schooner that sang in my heart and stays there. Next time, I will be more relaxed and share the tales of Fishtown. I was so moved by that boat as I sat in the cave of my silence, watching her gliding as a gull in the peace there are no words for. Vincent Farini, oh. September 1997. Wow. Our next reader is Peter Anastas, who, not only being a friend of Vincent, is one of the most earnest and dedicated lovers of Gloucester. His, his books about Gloucester, including his most recent, A Walker in the City, which I'm in the midst of reading and loving, portray the depth and complexity of this place so well. We're so blessed by his passion. Peter will be reading In the Arriving. When the first book of Charles Olson's Maximus poems uh, were published, um, there was uh, one of the poems called Letter Five, uh, in which Olson took Farini to task for publishing a little magazine in Gloucester called Four Winds, <coughs> uh, which had an international focus rather than a local focus. He was a bit tough on Vincent, um, saying that in some ways he had uh, betrayed the local. And one of the lines of the poem says, uh, where can we, we meet? Uh, I, 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 there's no place in Gloucester where we can meet now. Um, and Vincent was hurt by um, Olson's attack. Um, and Olson himself was somewhat hypocritical in that attack because he published in that magazine. Uh, so it, it wasn't as though he hadn't benefited uh, from the magazine. And friends of Vincent urged Vincent to fight back. Uh, but Vincent had a much finer sense of what you do with a friendship. And so instead of fighting back, he wrote an extraordinary poem uh, called In the Arriving. Uh, in which, in many ways, he celebrated his friendship with Olson and uh, talked about what he had learned from Olson, um, but also separated himself out in terms of what he knew uh, as a poet. I'm going to read a very brief section um, from In the Arriving, section eight. Um, it points really ahead uh, the, book was, uh, the book was published in 1954, but it points ahead to a lot of Vincent's thinking later in life and the richness um, of his uh, philosophical acceptance uh, of the ultimate questions. And I say this so we can go on. 
nothing is final. Not even death. Everything is in motion. Thank you. <laughs> Our next reader is Gordon Baird. Gordon will be reading The Zen Dream. We are at supper. Bayless, Anastas, Olson, myself, and some versi freaks. When Ed Kaplan expostulates on summarizing the prime innovators, illustrating with his own collage poem, one-liner zigzagging pictures, Xeros from glossy ads, when they see me as one of his images, they go shithouse. Olson, with his round priest head oogling amazement, and in his company, the others throwing the dirty dishes at Kaplan, spitting out bits of undigested food at this ballsy teacher. Olson disappearing into the shell of the unicorn he had hidden in the 28 Fort Square closet. On the wall of the Gloucester Daily Times, I see this graffiti of all the arts, only of the theater is everyone an authority on the form, the content, and the renditions. Anon! Our next reader is James Cook. James is an English teacher at Gloucester High School. I've sat in on his class, and he is truly a dedicated and inspiring teacher. We're lucky to have him. He also conducts workshops here at the Writers' Center, and James will be reading Termites in the Floor. So I've um, recently been rereading a lot of Vincent's pre Gloucester poems. Going, going, looking back at his time in Lynn, I've been particularly interested um, with my friend David Rich on exploring the, um, you know, sort of his role in uh, labor politics in Lynn at the time. And so I chose a poem that uh, reflects some of that. Um, and um, the other thing that struck me about this poem, choosing among the things I've been rereading, um, a line here um, uh, struck me as having to do with the, um, as being perhaps influenced by the Russian poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. And I, and I recently been talking to Dave about uh, v uh, Vincent's copy of Mayakovsky's work. And so to find a line that I'm just echoes off of something Mayakovsky wrote. Um, uh, Mayakovsky has this great um, Vincent-like passage, if you wish, I'll rage on raw meat like a vandal, or I'll change into uh, lives, uh, sorry, hues that the sunshine arouses. If you wish, I can be irreproachably gentle, not a man, but a cloud in trousers. <laughs> and the ju Vincent loved those juxtapositions, you know, this is Mayakovsky's stuff, but, but Vincent loved those juxtapositions, you know, two sides of the same coin and the outside insider and the inside outsider, and, you know, he loved that kind of play. And, um, but the, the, the bit, the cloud in trousers, uh, the cloud imagery comes up in this poem, and I just couldn't, uh, when Rufus asked what we'd read, this one spoke to me. So here's, here's Vincent's, uh, Termites in the Floor. They pick on him as if at the drying scab of a sore. Monday morning, they stick on his back. I am a jerk. They know he is sensitive as a cloud. He doesn't agree with them or talk their language. On winter days, open the window on his neck. He is slight and his chest fertilizes pneumonia. Oh, if my father had trained me to use my fists, Sweat beads his forehead, and his heart churns hatred. Someone stole a wrench from Joe's toolkit, and the owner blames him. If he broke someone's face, they would respect him, but he's not built that way. One day they shoved him in a box and nailed the top on, and his head boiled for weeks and is still seething. 
If only his thoughts could become poisoned arrows or his body a stick of dynamite, he'd invite them to a feast and then light the powder. The Japanese attack California and his brother fights them on the Solomons. They gave him a week or two and then they paint the seat behind him. This never happened before. Slowly his heart turns to ice. His mouth has lost the strength for words and his work is a bitter pill. He swallows every day in order to live. There are enemy agents here. Go on, he can take it. So it's a different side of the work experience, I think. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, sneak something else in here that one of my students found. They, they, uh, this time of year, every year, my, my students are engaged in a, a, something called the Gloucester uh, Project, which is uh, they research some aspect of uh, Gloucester uh, culture. Um, and uh, the student was looking through the vertical file at um, Sorfree Library and found <laughs> this uh, letter to Gloucester City Council from October 1980. Dogtown is Gloucester's sacred territory. Keep those buzzing monsters off the, of the devil off our holy land. Once they go up, we'll have them sawing in our sleep, sawing the ghosts of the first settlers, sawing second thoughts too late, sawing bird watchers, sawing moonshine hunters, sawing dedicated runners, sawing sightseers, sawing blizzards, sawing pollen, sawing wild birds, and sawing the last vestige of peace in the heart of this island. How dare they disturb this salt air wilderness? Just don't let these wind power entrepreneurs strap their row of metallic aliens to our beloved sanctuary. Vincent Farini. <laughs> Crazy. Our next reader is David Domain. David has taught high school in California, New York, and for 24 years at Northfield Mount Hermon in the classics department. He moved to Gloucester two years ago and is delighted by the city and its people. David will read The Tiny Room. As, as Rufus said, um, I'm new to Gloucester and uh, been trying to learn as much about it as I can. And um, from, I guess, all of you, I've, I've learned that Vincent Farini is a big part of Gloucester and I should uh, learn something about him. So Rufus gave me a few books of his poems and I read them through. And I hit upon this poem, which I really like. Um, it was easy in some ways for me to relate to it because it's about getting up early. <laughs> it's about family. It's about a day. Um, it's about the mystery of going to sleep. <laughs> has some wonderful lines in it. Uh, has a lot of things I can relate to and a lot of things I haven't figured out about it yet, <laughs> which is the characteristic of good poems, I think. It's called The Tiny Room. The tiny room in the tree is where I live. I leave with the dawn key and enter with the moon. I have my supper of minutes and laughter and exchange tales with my children. The factory is in a forgotten city. We dance to the wobbler's chant and explore the sky take time apart, and with singing eyes, approach the magic world of sleep. Wife and mother, in the air, and the open window, in our room, snug, in the tree, brew memory with the moon. Henry Farini is co-founder of this wonderful Writer Center and the North Shore Jazz Project. He's been making nonfiction films since the 70s. He's Vincent's nephew and has created a film about him entitled Poet Poem in Action. He's going to read At the Brink. Yeah, I wanted to read this particular poem because uh, it was great to actually be in that room in 1985 when Vincent was uh, laying this out to the city council and Jane Bonatti was actually opened the film with it because Jane was like, oh God, 
<laughs> Here he comes again. <laughs> and, and she made this, she had this tone of voice. She, she said, would you just please state your name and address for the record, please? And Vincent like, just like, just so lays it out as the importance of this and then and, and reads this poem. Anyhow, it's a beautiful poem. And it's uh, as uh, <coughs> important uh, today as uh, it, it was back in February 26th of uh, 1985. Um, it's called At the Brink. He says, Madam Chair, Counselors, and Fellow Citizens, we are at the brink. Fishing is our core life and the waterfront, the original signature. So we guard against the wildfire greed that will destroy this harbor of the working class. And we all know what kind of storm this is. Will property owners resist the seduction of megabucks and save their birthrights and their communities? Beware of becoming barracudas, it is one ocean. I say it's not just fishing you will kill, but Christ himself, the fisher of souls in ourselves. Fishing's high and low tides are in our solitary hearts. Some boats go down, but most continue arriving loaded to the gills though we still have to reckon with scarcities and quotas, the Canadians and the breeding grounds. Fishing carries on in spite of these tragedies and comedies we are heir to. Will the homeowners and processors around the harbor sell out to the developers for a quick fortune? Betraying Howard Blackburn, Centennial Johnson, the valiant captains, every drowned fisherman, Charlie Lowe, Gordon Thomas, Charles Olson, Philip Weld, and others? Do you think the steel of the Gloucester fishers are a thing of the past only? Think again. This gutting, the genius of Gloucester for a condo city. I say we will not permit the death of our city as, it, as we have known it for over 350 years. And as we know it personally, we must fight with imagination, with all our resources, our dedication and courage to protect tomorrow's today by keeping the acute sense of fishing alive. Remember, one drop of seawater is the whole of it, the whole of it one drop. All things are loaned to us. Private liberty is exercised by community responsibility. We are a new fisher people, the sum of social indivi individuals, the intelligence of the other ocean. And Vince doesn't say this, but in the film he closes it by saying, we got to fight for this town because it's worth it. So that's at the brink. I knew Vincent because he was the father of one of my dear friends in high school, Deirdre, and Liz, Liz as well. Um, and Deirdre died of leukemia at the end of her junior year in 1963. And until the last time I saw Vincent, every time I saw him walking down Main Street or anywhere, he just broke down, started sobbing, and climbed into my arms. Um, so I just, I wanted to read a little piece <clears throat> that he writes in his autobiography about Deirdre. On the way back from the hospital with the family, the steel band of my watch tightens around my wrist. It does not stop and it is paining me. I have taken the others to the Fairview. Fairview? In the shop, I take the watch off. It reads 5.30. 
and there is an itching and a piece of dead skin which I pick off with my fingernail. A half hour passes, the phone rings, and the hospital tells me that you died at 5.30, January 1st, 1963. Gray guilt hangs over the house, over the shop. The grief is unbearable. Your mother is a pillar of iron. She is afraid that I am crumbling under the weight of it and may not survive. At the undertaker's, I quake. When everyone is gone, I come over to you and say, Deirdre, I wrote the poem, but I did not read it to you. I am going to now, and I lay it beside your folded hands, a golden poem. <clears throat> <clears throat> and this is the poem. It's called Persimmons for Deirdre. In a purple nook, a persimmon tree. Midnight's a heartbird, alights on a leaf and sings the sleep along, flying off at dawn. Days as vast as going, coming and overhead, white clouds, unwinding special hours. Between this grove and the world shielding rain, a look, rosebud, full, unburst, and behind a forehead, the flame of knowing. Close the murmuring sea, the moon's hound pulling awake, sleeping, and sleep awake. Beautiful tree and living on air, a gossamer feeling, radiating, caught hallow, praise the untelling tree. Down is up, O mansion of stars. I bind it in this I bind it in gold paper and I give it to you. So it was such a poignancy to our connection. Okay. Oh, oh, our next reader is Joanne Hart. Joanne is the author of the novels Float and Adult. Her short fiction, essays, and articles have been widely published. And a 10 minute play that she actually wrote here in a workshop with Linda Robinson was produced at, a Boston, at the, the Boston Playwrights Theater. Joanne will be reading Mural of the Harbor. Um, I chose um, Mural of the Harbor. It was uh, such a, a lovely, uh, sort of gentle nod to 19th century poets. Mural of the Harbor. It was the hour before the final sleep. The half hour before being born, the flood tide of blue gold with Emily at tea among tall marshes. The hour when lover and beloved meet racing past each other and Whitman hacking for muscles and conches among the mud flats of anchored twilight. An August of Fitzhugh Lane's Odyssey and St. Mary had a sweat of spider dust slid straight in a denouement taboo that the treasury has no price tag. It was the chill in the shoes of long ago waiting for the chartreuse of something else when the creek's current and the Atlantic had between them a cosmic intercourse, a strange sky time and people couldn't stay indoors when Veronica's tear fell into Emily's Chinese cup and a crow became the other Mayflower persona, the street walkers a memory of Conant's fault. It was the sense of rust, the cleavage of classes, heavy as a pyramid and has in it a star's writing when octogenarian consulted the crystal egg on the ocean's desert and the elite clung to their velvet insurances. That hour, Portagee Hill Street ran over Eastern Point, and their dogs groaned helplessly through the horned moon. When the angelus of sunken schooners prayed to Our Lady and spilled their coffers at her feet, it was and then it wasn't ever again when the light struck all the people dumb with an ennui, and they saw the fiery angel of death where life is, and they beheld it for the first time. Sunrise and moonset, 
dawns and sunfalls all mixing together and the suspense of it hung the city inside as the whistle of a single yarrow stalk has saint's melody but an insane laughter cries in the marrow. Thank you. Our next reader is Dorothy Nelson. Dorothy is a widely published poet. She's on the board of the Writer Center and a huge supporter of local poets. Recently, she read my book uh, of poetry and gave it back to me with notes on every page about how each poem struck her, which was the most incredible experience. I've, I've gone back and read her notes so many times. I'm just going to read a few sections of the poem Ex Cathedra because it's a long poem, but and this poem, <clears throat> and it's also um, seems to be connected, to, well, yeah, to, to the longer poem, Preamble to Divinity, um, where I think Vincent is exploring poetry, the ideas of poetry. Like the first line is, what is the poet's medium, language? What is language for, participation? And, um, here he also talks about the poet as the primal ma magician, a transformer of matter, mind, and the maker of experiences that affect other planes of existence. That poet is the heart-mind, and that's one word, heart-mind, of the individual, the animal, the insect, loam of the earth, and the cosmic awareness and openness of the infant. No one and anything is excluded. And then there's another title, Ex Cathedra, which means from this chair, from probably right here where he was mm -hmm. sitting. The poem ain't words alone. It waits. The poem can't stop on the page. The amount of energy determines the duration and the destination. The words spoken or read are a surplus value of concentration, enhancing nature and extra dimensions. To get the poet out of the way for delivering the living water. After that, everything works by itself. That action alters the person, the family, and the surrounding community for the life engendering forces of surprising the poem mating with action. And then um, one more part of this long poem, and that's it. Uh, after the death of the creeds, social experience, the religion of the free market, the modern dinosaurs, the private psyche outdated, not enough mother's milk, generations brought up on the bottle, the blood of ink bypassed for anemic photocopy. The dryness is suffocating. The brain is frantic for oxygen. Erzarts is the rebuilt godhead. The mind slinks away from enervating repetitions. You can just hear him. He has so much he wants to get off his mind on this. <laughs> the simple and abstruse is verboten. Do you think the children are blind to the bullshit? Oh, wonderful outwitterings. Don't dare qu question profit, the ultimate value kids raid, the stupidities of self-interest, the sacredness of double talking, and the poets, magicians of the word, where are they? Who gives them any attention besides makers of the same? It's really, it's wonderful to get all of these different aspects of Vincent. It's, 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 it's just really a great idea. <laughs> Our next reader is Charlie Olson son of the poet Charles Olson, and an old friend of Vincent's. Charlie's owner of C.P. Olson Carpentry, and he will be reading The Olson Strain. Well, I'm, I'm struck with a couple of things. Um, just listening, it's interesting how when you um, hear other people's impressions of somebody, it sort of kicks your own up. 
Um, Peter, uh, I, I didn't really realize that, that that sort of glitch between my father and Vincent happened in 54 because um, my experience with Vincent was always very uh, dear to me and he never really, if there was any issue in the air of the adults, he really didn't carry it forward with, uh, with me, which is really an honorable quality, you know. And the other thing that just, uh, I, I guess, was just a re, re upped, which is I didn't know Deirdre died in 63 because my mother died in 63. And mm. I think that sort of like, <laughs> weirdly, I mean, I knew Vincent my whole life, but it was sort of more intense from like 54, 55, 56 uh, to 63. And then it was like, it was just all. <laughs> It was like, that's all we could all take. It was just too sad after that because, uh, but I always remember him very dearly. I mean, he did these great things when I was a kid. Um, and it's a fair amount of time ago now. Um, so um, the poem that I'm reading you is not very uh, profound, but it's kind of interesting in that um, it's what I like about a poem, it's sort of, um, it does something. It, it, it actually, um, I, I'll tell you, Henry and I, when uh, Vincent died, he, um, uh, Henry let me come into the house uh, here and look for this thing that I'd given him, a present, because I didn't want it to get lost in the shuffle, because uh, it, it could have. And um, we looked around and we couldn't find it. and. Uh, just recently, Henry gave me some books to, to find a poem to read at you all tonight. And I'm looking through these books, and there was the answer in a poem. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read you the poem. Mm -hmm. And it goes like this. It's called The Olsen Strain. Uh, it's very short. Uh, he handed me for my birthday his tiny ivory boat. As light as a fingernail, his father had given him when he was a kid. I placed it in the belly of my silver fish. So, Henry, we have to find the silver fish, and then we'll be able to find my boat. Yeah, so. Our next reader is Annie Thomas, co-founder of the Writer Center and certainly a, always a shining and welcoming presence here. Vincent was a friend of hers for more than 40 years, and I hope you tell your little story about <laughs> the daily <laughs> visits. He was the godfather of her children, and she'll be reading the, poem, the poems, The Subtle Flesh and another short poem that she's chosen. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Well, Vincent was a wonderful friend for 40 years, and I met him when I was 19 and I was working in Dunkin' Donuts, the one to seven in the morning shift, and all the cops and fishermen came in, and then about 10 to seven every morning, Vincent would come in and have a plain crawler and a black coffee. He was, <laughs> he was very abstemious. And since I was living here in East Gloucester, he'd give me a ride, and so he became my dearest, one of my dearest friends for many years. He was true and helpful and wonderful. So these are very personal. The Subtle Flesh. That evening of the shifting lover's lanes, when fantasies and reality dueled on a brink, and faith kept them hungry and lean, and two families reassessed their dealings at peace with each other's rare abundance. You gave me a jar of twelve wide-eyed daisies to guard my night's descent against the banshees. These little sisters of the sunflower's doings led me through the nether regions of decay. The yellow scent infused my night's journey and carried me back to daylight of my core. You my vigil, he my first mate on the ship Jonah. We swallow it and it engulfs our shapes as we stare out of interrelationships. 
That was 1985. And then this one, I don't even know when this one was. It was really early on. But I, it's one of my favorites because it's really about any loving relationship. The dialectics of exchanges, thou and I, your blood breath in mine, the flesh of our palm. Oh. Yeah. We're going to um, close tonight with the Sibley family, delightfully. Um, three of them are going to read poem that Vincent wrote about their mother. So Liz, who's a clay sculptor, George, who's an attorney and also spends a lot of time working on the waterfront at his low tide marina, and Myrne, who's a biologist at New England Biolabs. And Peggy, their mother, was a very highly valued character in Gloucester. So the title is Mother of the Sea's Insight, Our Harbor's Arms. And this is written um, a few days after she died in 2000. They say you are dead, Peggy. What a misconception. <laughs> you knew when you were dancing at the cliff that you were already jumping into liberties that never end. <laughs> Delighting at the very edge was a news to behold, as most of your children did and all your dearest friends. Now the looking can do what you did, intoxicated with life and its problems, way ahead at this island of lighthouses, flashing rays. Flourishing it, as you did, still doing, riding your bicycle around the rim of the moon, uh -huh. dipping your toes into the sun's fire of enthusiasm for all things, existing in so many places, enjoying it fully because this is a continuous circle of metamorphoses. Enfolding my hands at the festival of your birth, we gloried in the lust for this extraordinary theater, which is always continuous. We never go to sleep, do we, Peggy? We're so busy infusing everyone we know with our blood mind's contagion, making love and children, seeing the pleasures of community we, we have yet to thoroughly deepen our city with. Oh, fisherwoman, the minnows in our veins are swimming backward and fast forward, relaxed, because you, beloved soul, are still alive as everyone here, getting closer to our navigating heart. You, Peggy, are in no time and space, because there are no demarcations, no breaks, no disappearances. It is the rhythm of interdimensionals we have yet to stimulate. Oh, heroine hero, what consummate style, how you look on the whole city into your embrace, nothing less. As is, was then, so it is now. Your boy, tolling statements, the penetrations of your eyelight is in the heads of those who know you, even the ones on the sidelines. Oh, how you injected our city with the something that is always hiding, that verb that is a transformer, transmuting the routine into acts of daily discoveries by being who each one is as you are still. What a family this is. What realized individuals. Death is a misnomer for the processes of uninterrupted divinities as you with your hands on our compass of the constant creation's bliss of this. Yes. Oh. Bliss of this. Bliss of this. It's the poem. This is uh, this book I picked up when I was still uh, off island. I, I lived here when I was a kid, but I didn't know Vincent then. Um, but I picked this up when I used to take the train up here before I even started visiting Henry. <coughs> and. Uh, and I started picking up Vincent poetry and stuff. I didn't know at that point that when I recorded Vincent Farini's greatest hits, it would become one of, this would become one of my greatest hits. It's part of my <laughs> repertoire now. <laughs> Not the whole thing, but you know, the rest of what I'm saying. So this is the last page of his autobiography, Permit of the Clouds. Any street I walk through, up and down, 
around Cape Annie, her slip, the unstill aurora of her eyes, every inch of a change, the modalities and the coves, her graces, the coves, especially the thigh moss of God town. Unless the day has the Atlantic in my lock, that day cannot begin. Every inch of this island is holy. I wake up with it, work with it, sleep with it, dream with it, loving every piece of it and the whole at once. What cannot be taken away? The temple outside me, in me, I am inside of. Life is the poem. 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 I think we've written down first. <laughs>